Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, months of negotiations lead to police accountability reforms passing the legislature, and the Senate attempts to persuade Governor Walls to allow local decision making on reopening schools. Stay tuned for this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The second special session Senate concluded this week, and the legislature passed a bill to improve oversight and accountability in policing. The debate in the Senate took place Tuesday in the early morning hours. Mr. President, the uh, bill that we will soon be uh, receiving from the House is one that is a product of compromise as well as uh, some very good conversation regarding the future of Minnesota policing. Uh, much of this was inspired by the recent death and arrest and death of uh, George Floyd, and it caused Minnesota to think about how our policies regarding law enforcement, the products of arrest, the products of discipline of our police force uh, are being handled, and how at this very instantaneous time after that death of how we can resolve and get ourselves on the f a good first step in affecting responsible policing throughout the state of Minnesota. It provides tools for departments that do need help in developing community relations and developing a better understanding of the environment in which they may be forced to operate, specifically the training on mental illness and mental health Autism, in, in particular, is very important for peace officers to understand when they're dealing with people who are having mental issues. Our work is not done because people are still crying. They're crying for change. And when people are crying, it is our duty, it is our job as legislator to change the law. Law that people will feel safe and law that are safe for people and law that protect people and not giving institution the excessive power to abuse. This bill allows cities and counties to offer incentives to encourage police officers and residents for the communities they work in. Mr. President, we don't think that that goes far enough. It establishes a police excellence and improving community relations board under the post board. Uh, and though we know that that was tightly negotiated, we think that there could have been a better chance of adding uh, members to be integrated, as Senator Limmer said, uh, we thought that that would have been a better place. Um, it ma does mandate mental illness training, and we're appreciative of that uh, so that officers are not put in a place in a position to do things that they're not trained to do. We do appreciate the mandating of the autism training uh, some of the other things, the duty to intercede and changes to the arbitration process. While the bill was a product of compromise and includes some priorities of the PLCI, PLCI caucus, it lacks the teeth, members, and it lacks the strong, robust policies that build the much-needed trust between the black community and law enforcement. This bill lacks the critical language such as penalties for bad actors and protections against retaliation who report those bad actors. We know that this bill is actually not the bill that communities of color want. We have been told that from the very beginning. The communities that are impacted by police brutality want more. They want transformational policy, and this bill is just not that. This is a compromise bill, and in compromise, those that are involved in the debate don't always get everything they want, and uh, nevertheless, it does put, it does reveal that there are issues that need to be resolved in this subject area, and as others have said, this is an important first step. We did ban chokeholds, except if you're trying to protect the life of that individual or he was protecting somebody else. 
we did focus on the sanctity of life, uh, recognizing that as police approach situations, we want the least amount of force possible, but sometimes they need a lot of force. We did focus on mental health and autism and, and how do we address some of those situations so that we don't have moms losing loved ones in those situations. We did have more input from citizens, adding two more people to the post board and then forming a citizen advisory committee. But we did not want the citizens to, to have authority over the post board. Like all boards, this board needs to be run by the professionals within it. So in this case, it's police, and others it's attorneys, and others it's accountants. But we thought it was particularly important to have citizens engaged in speaking to these organizations to make sure that they were the best they could be. We did reform arbitration, which creates the ability to pluck out bad apples when they're not doing their job. That was a big step. And we did offer incentives for police to live in the communities they're from. We didn't want to force them to do that. There are reasons sometimes that police don't want to live in their particular community. Wednesday, I spoke with Senator Patricia Torres Ray, a member of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus who represents a portion of Minneapolis. The final vote in the Senate on the Police Accountability Reform Bill was 60 to 7. You voted against this bill. On the Senate floor, you said that this is not the bill that communities of color want. Where does it fall short? There are several pieces that were not included in this bill. And the, the pieces that were included, in my opinion, were not strong enough. For example, the need to provide training, mental health training, understanding you know how to deal with people who have mental health is a very important component of this bill both law enforcement and the community wants it we put some language in it but there is no funding behind it that's just a, a very good example of policy that is there that could do some good things but i'm not necessarily sure about how this is going to work other pieces are similar in the sense that we have, for instance, in the post board, we have now um, uh, will be appointed by the governor, um, but th th that we will have, uh, excuse me, in the post board, the uh, investigative uh, licensure actions uh, was com the, the, the subcommittee was composed of uh, uh, three, and now we will have a, a larger. Um, a, a larger um, advisory council. Group, advisory council, and it will yeah. include two people from the public. The balance in there, in my opinion, is is not is not a strong enough right now. Uh, we need to have input. It needs to be more balanced. We need to have input from the public that is more robust in order to really be able to make the significant changes that are required. Then there are other elements in there about, you know, we, that, that we've tried with the uh, Minneapolis, for instance, model, where we have advisory councils, where we have participation of the public, but then there is no enforcement. There are no tools. What happens if these recommendations actually are not implemented, if they are not adopted? What are the consequences? I think at the core, what this bill doesn't do is really offer that. What, what are the consequences? What are the ramifications? What are the discipline consequences for, for you know, law enforcement when they don't comply? And so when you don't have that, what you have, in my opinion, is a lot of good guidance, which is not bad. You cannot criticize guidance, but then it doesn't offer the tools to make sure that if that guidance and that direction is not adopted, then there are consequences. So, so that is, is really, um, the main issue for me right now that I just don't believe that that those elements are incorporated into this bill. So later in your speech, you mentioned transformational policy and because transformation takes time and can be incremental. And as you're saying, essentially what we have is is incremental change, perhaps towards transformation, transformational change. Is this a step at least in the right direction? I think it is. I think it is. and and. 
you know, one, one of the, the obstacles that we faced this particular time was the lack of engagement in the Senate. This was a very important process. It was an unprecedented process for the state of Minnesota, where there was significant engagement in the community and very good ideas and support, I would say, in many levels. Many people think that law enforcement was not part of this conversation, is the opposite. I think law enforcement really wants to be part of this conversation. They have good ideas, they know what needs to be done, but we did not have a good process that incorporated a conversation between the community, the House and the Senate. And so as a result of that, you know, these conversations and these negotiations were made kind of behind doors at the last minute and the only, the only body that really had through conversations with the community, and I stated that in the floor, was really the House. The House actually did have hearings. They did provide the public an opportunity to get input so that we can shape this bill in a way that really respond to these very significant needs that we have today. So for me, it's more of a process problem than it is policy problem, because I do believe that people have good ideas. I do believe that we're capable of implementing those ideas, but without a process, we just don't know what those ideas are. And, you know, I, I, I think that the expertise that exists in, in the House and in the Senate is, is very limited. We don't have a lot of members who have served in the law enforcement community, to be honest. We have a few attorneys, but we don't have people with expertise. And so we have to make sure that we have a very strong process of engagement with the community to understand what that is. So speaking of process, the 2021 legislative session uh, will be the next opportunity for perhaps a more robust process, uh, depending on the outcome of the election, the DFL Senate may be in control. What policies would you like to see put forward in the next session to address some of this? Law enforcement for me is part of the work that we need to do. It's is, is, is an important part. But for me, law enforcement deals with consequences of problems that we have in our society. And for me to put all of that effort into changing behaviors, changing policy, and changing directions for law enforcement, this is a, a very important piece, which is what happened in the life of an individual, in the life of a community that actually brought that situation to the attention of law enforcement. I wanna focus on that too. We have an overwhelming disparities in the state of Minnesota, deep pervasive disparities that we have not addressed. I am very concerned about the next biennium and the work that we are going to have to do next year during our budget year when we have a significant deficit that we have to address. We have a long list of requests around housing, law enforcement, health care, education, technology, jobs. We're going to have to address all of these needs in the middle of a deficit, a significant deficit. My fear is that we have not begun that conversation yet. What are we going to do? Where are we going to cut? Remember that 90% of the budget is healthcare, health and human services, and education. We don't have a lot of money in any other budgets. Those are it. Mm -hmm. Those are the areas where we have significant needs and where we have the deepest disparities. The conversation about how are we going to address this budget has not even, even started. I am in the process of writing a letter to the governor to ask him to engage in that conversation because no matter who is in the majority, they're going to have to make some very important decisions that tie into these disparities, this distress, all of these problems that we face as a state and as a nation, and that as a consequence, we have you know, all of these issues that we need to address in law enforcement and um, you know, safety in our communities. So to me, they have to go together. And we have to make a greater effort to, to focus on those conversations. Senator Patricia Torres-Ray, we have to leave it there. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. 
And on Thursday, Governor Walz signed the Police Reform and Accountability Bill into law. Every single Minnesotan deserves to feel safe and protected in their communities. This bipartisan piece of legislation moves us towards a critical step towards criminal justice reform. These critical reforms are long overdue. They are meant to strengthen transparency and community oversight. They do some things that I think many thought were already the law. They ban chokeholds and warrior training and expand de-escalation training for our officers. But we understand this is only a beginning. I'm proud that Minnesota is taking these steps. There's been a lot of hard work and long nights to get us to this moment. But I'm really grateful to be here, taking the first steps towards meaningful police accountability and reform. And I want to be clear, these are only the first steps. Also, during the recently completed second special session, the Senate passed a resolution asking Governor Walls not to use his executive powers to make a unilateral decision regarding the opening of public schools this fall. The question is, who can best make the determination how to do so safely? Governor Walz has also indicated the importance of local control, but districts are asking for guidance, for benchmarks, for infection data that can best be provided through the state in a partnership. So we need to act safely, we need to act responsibly, and you, dis you don't disarm the executive branch in doing that. I feel you, we, we are abdicating our responsibility to students, their families, to staff, and others. We only exacerbate the risk by not having this available during a pandemic. In this debate right now, it comes down to the bottom line is do we think that our kids should be in school this fall and would benefit from that, or do we think not? And now we're going to pack their backpacks with hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies and masks. They're going to be traumatized. They're going to be scared. They're going to be horrified. I'd like to find one school psychologist that says that's how kids learn best is when they're scared and traumatized and horrified. And I will suggest to you, for all his good intentions, the, uh, the things that have gone not as well for our governor's decisions have been when he has been too categorical and too broad and not allowing the locals to decide. All of this debate about the emergency powers goes to this simple question. Is it better for Minnesota to have a governor with emergency powers? It is. And then finally, members, as we debate these emergency powers and stripping this governor, which uh, 49 of 50 states still have governors with emergency powers, so I'm still waiting for a question from a week ago to be answered, which is why Minnesota would be any different than any of these other states, different from the president of the United States. What is it? that the majority party thinks makes Minnesota so different that we have to do something that 49 of 50 states have not done. Because this is not taking away the governor's influence in any way, shape, or form. The governor and his department of education can still put out guidelines for what they think should be done. And it's up to the school districts to decide which of those that they will implement and how they will be implemented. That's the beauty of local control. As Senator Gazelka and I talked about on this floor a week ago, at that time, we had not lost anyone under the age of 20. And as of today, that has, as I expressed, might happen tragically. It tragically has. And as Senator Swazinski also mentioned, we are hearing over and over and over again about serious illnesses and lasting effects that young people have when they get exposed to this virus. Now, fortunately, it does look like, and this is still new, we are all still learning. Our public health officials are still learning, our medical professionals, our scientists are still learning. It looks like most children, when they get this virus, they turn out to be okay. But they have parents, they have families. What about parents? Well, most parents I've talked to think 
that it's important for their kids to be in school for a variety of reasons, but they know it's important for their kids to be in school. And if for some reason they choose not to, they have other alternatives. They have other things they can do. They can do homeschool, they can do online, but the parent is involved in that driver's seat position. A decision from Governor Walls on how schools will operate this fall is expected this week. Last week, I spoke with Senate Education Chair Carla Nelson about her views on the subject, and I began by asking what she thinks is the best approach. I think the question is, why is this so important? Uh, obviously, it's important for our students' health. We know the American <clears throat> Academy of Pediatrics has recently come out and spoken about how important this is for students' health, whether it be mental health, um, uh, not having isolation, certainly the educational aspect, nutrition, all of those things. Uh, of course, and we're also finding that the health of others has not been impacted either by s countries that have opened up their schools. Uh, we're finding that the virus uh, is not as, um, not as effective or does not infect children or nor are they infectious as much as what maybe was originally thought. And I think the one thing that also is on people's minds is economic stability. Um, about one third of our workforce is parents who have minor children. And these parents, uh, and if we're gonna see them go back to work, they have to know about childcare and school. And I just got notices today from businesses that are having a difficult time with employees knowing how to plan for their next month's schedule. Are they hiring childcare or nannies one week at a time? What does that look like? So that's a problem. And then of course, parents want that too. So do you think it should be a statewide mandate or do you think it should be left up to local districts to decide for themselves how to proceed? Oh, definitely. Uh, this needs to be a local decision. It is impossible for one person in St. Paul to know the conditions on the ground all across the state, 300 school districts, 100 charter schools, all corners of our state to know what the risks are, how to mitigate those, what the needs are, what the resources are, and that's why it needs to be a locally determined decision. I do not think the governor should be making this decision. In that case, what about liability? What if a small school district in you know, greater Minnesota opens, but it leads to the unintended consequences of several grandparents falling ill and, and perhaps dying? You know, Not that you can necessarily trace it to the school, but the chances of the spread are much greater. Um, and that is where schools most locally can determine how to minimize the spread, whether it be only a portion of kids coming to school on Monday and Tuesday and another portion on Wednesday and Thursday, maybe some extra help on Friday. How that happens uh, can best be determined at the local level. We could be having schools that are renting uh, small storefronts, open storefronts that are, maybe the businesses aren't in there, but perhaps it could be a, like a one room schoolhouse. Uh, we could have a lot of flexibility and creativity to keep kids safe. Because parents, 64% uh, of parents, 94% of them want their kids back in school full time, but they want it to be safe. You have to do both. Have your kids there physically, but also have it safe. And that requires that local decision and those local use of resources. So in terms of following safety guidelines, um, generally that does mean social distancing. And so if schools do uh, have sort of a, an individual approach, there's still potentially a lack of funds. Uh, if we do social distancing on buses, does that mean more buses? If we do social distancing in the classroom, does that mean smaller classrooms, more teachers? What about the funding ramifications of some of these decisions? Well, I think that's on the uh, top of everyone's mind. Uh, things are going to be more costly uh, because of transportation, increased cleaning, those type of things. But I also think it gives us an opportunity to do things in an innovative way and do things differently. Uh, so again, local decisions innovation. When it comes to funding, uh, we know that the federal government is really looking at this as well. Already they have sent $500 million about for education to the state of Minnesota. Uh, there are discussions out in D.C. of additional funding to help our schools open safely. And I think that will be needed. Unfortunately, our states uh, do not have money. We're most likely going to be coming back into session with a significant deficit. 
uh, unlike the federal government, we must live with a balanced budget, which, mm -hmm. by the way, I think is a good thing. Uh, but that means we are going to be looking at the federal government for help in allowing our schools to have the resources to open for physical presence of our students in a safe manner. Now, there's also the issue of disparities because it has been shown that the students who have um, lower achievement are also those who don't have the home structure that would lend itself to learning at home. Also, uh, they maybe don't have the technology to even get the work done. Does getting them back in the classroom despite safety concerns, is, is that the right move then? Well, I think it has to be with safety concerns. I don't know that anyone would want their children to go back into a classroom if it wasn't safe. So we can do that safely. We must do that safely. Uh, so it, it's not in spite of, but I will say this, uh, pandemics exacerbate trends. And so we were seeing a trend where we were having children that had disparities in educational outcomes. And that has, I believe, been magnified under the governor's executive order to go to distance learning. And let me say, I tip my hat to our teachers to think that they were tasked with eight days to prepare uh, three months of education, K through 12, to go to distance learning in eight days. That is an impossible task. And we should not be surprised that, according to many, it did not turn out so well. And now we have to regroup, make sure that our kids get the education that they need, all of our kids, and that they have the resources to do that. And I think it will be a blended learning, hybrid learning, um, and it will be in, in the classroom as well, of course. So we need to get those resources to the kids. And we should, we should build upon what we've learned through this distance learning experiment. What about teachers then? They, they're required to go back in the classroom. Let's say they have an underlying health condition or they're, they're more further down the age range. They're closer to retirement. Sure. What, if, what if they leave or what if they don't feel safe? What, outside of retirement, do they have an option? Well, I think uh, certainly you cannot make somebody continue on in a job if, if they don't want to or if they don't feel safe or they don't think it's in their best interest or their health concerns. So I believe that is uh, you know, something that not just our schools will need to cross, but all across our uh, state as things begin to open up and open up safely. How is that going to impact workers? And also, what if the customers don't come back? My next question is like parents. Let's say the parents mm -hmm. are uncomfortable putting their children back in the school. Is, is there an exemption for them? Yes, there always is an exemption for parents. Uh, parents can homeschool their children. They can put them in a smaller charter school. They can use a private school. There's a variety of options for parents. And there's also, because of the world we live in now, there's a lot of digital uh, personalized education that's available to kids that was not available uh, at a reasonable cost. Uh, we've been able to scale that up now. So there's a number of private entities that are also offering that, that K-12 learning experience. Senator Carla Nelson, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.